in this edition of Art Rocks, a Mardi Gras crew that goes the extra mile in their public performance. I want to entertain this crowd. 200,000 people come to this parade. I'd like to give them a show. A photographer remembers a treasured loved one in a unique way. It is sort of me interacting with her and creating her um, is a way of sort of me trying to get back to her. And we examine a renowned artist's largest and final work. One child came through and said car wash. Other people think science fiction and space travel. It's all ahead on this edition of Art Rocks. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello, I'm James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads Magazine, and this is Art Rocks. Carnival is celebrated in many different locales and the traditions that develop in each town can be quirky as well as unique. For Baton Rouge's Spanish Town Mardi Gras Parade, the crowds count on a synchronised lawnmower drill team to provide the kind of entertainment that you can't find anywhere else. Happy Mardi Gras. For many, carnival time in Louisiana means spectacular parade floats, flamboyant costumes, king cake, and of course throws. But for some, Mardi Gras preparations include polishing up your Converse sneakers, firing up your glue gun, and making sure your lawn mower is decorated. These are all necessary steps if you're a member of the crew of Yazoo. For over 30 years, this precision synchronized lawn mower drill team has performed in the Spanish Town Mardi Gras Parade in downtown Baton Rouge. Back in the early 80s, this Mardi Gras parade was not much more than a quirky neighborhood celebration held the Saturday before Fat Tuesday and the crew of Yazoo was accordingly a modest venture. One night in 1983, David got a call from Ted Hicks and said, David, have you got a lawnmower? Have you got an old hat? Meet me downtown at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. One of the parade officials of San, uh, Spanish Town Parade says, let's do this thing he saw in California, uh, which was uh, these guys just pushing lawnmowers. There were seven lawnmower guys. They called themselves the Cat Shredders because the parade was cats. And that was the first year. The next year was 1984, and the mowers were back. The George Orwell novel, 1984, and of course, in the novel, Big Brother Knows Everything. So we were the lawn police, and Lee made us these big eyes because we see all and know all about your lawns. Quite a contrast with today's Spanish Town celebration, which attracts revelers in the hundreds of thousands. The evolution of the crew of Yazoo has mirrored that of the parade. Behind the success of the group are a couple with an extraordinary commitment to this annual public performance. David and Lee Randall spend countless hours working with members of the crew to create a new spectacle each year. I want to entertain this crowd. 200,000 people come to to this parade, I'd like to give them a show. Yes, there are other lawnmower groups out there, a bunch of them, I've, I've seen uh, YouTube videos of them, but uh, I think ours is much more anal. We come up with a different theme every year. We have different costumes every year. We have, year we have different choreography. Lee is obsessed with uh, making everything stand out visually, a unified costume theme, and I am obsessed with, with choreography, the precision, seen in some of these high school drill teams. That's what I would aspire to. So that's, that's my obsession. And uh, I strive every year to improve on that. And Lee's obsession is it's got to look like a cartoon. It's got to co cost next to nothing because we, uh, on average, have to make about 45 costumes. It has to be easy to wear. It has to be fairly durable, grab-proof. First, I have to make the prototype costume. And, you know, there's no pattern for a Pepe Le Pew head. I just have to kind of make it, then tear it down and make a pattern from it. And then each little piece and part needs a pattern. And once I get all the patterns made, 
the crew comes over and we set up shop. It's a number of pieces and then she delegates you know, I need you to spray paint heads, I need you to cut out ears, I need you to sew tails, I need feathers on here. We put in uh, four Sundays, the four consecutive Sundays uh, before the parade, practicing. And I always like to put part of the costume on to make sure it, it works, there aren't any major obstructions, and to see how, uh, how it's going to hold up, and mainly to, uh, to entertain my crew and motivate them as to how funny or not it's going to be. There has been some cross-dressing. The year that we were the Carmen Mirandas, uh, we wore the big fruit headdress and flouncy skirts, and it was freezing cold. It was 32 degrees, and it was sleeting outside. So we had gloves on with our Carmen Miranda outfits and just danced on down the road. And the next day was the Sunday Advocate was the first time David got a full color front page spread in the middle of a Carmen Miranda twist. And when he got to work at Exxon, there were six copies of it posted on the bulletin board with some kind of unsavory comments. Moe's Ark was right after Katrina and seemed very appropriate to have a play on Noah's Ark. It was a, just a blast making all those different animals and having to stretch my brain a little bit to figure out how was I going to make an elephant out of rubber foam with a trunk that moved. I could have just made a stationary trunk, but no, I had to figure out how to cut everything so that the trunk would swing back and forth. The most difficult to make were the robot costumes because there were a million pieces. We had a separate chest plate, a separate one for males, a separate one for females, little strips that went across the chest pieces with little buttons on it and antenna on the helmet and just about anything you can imagine on a robot we had on our robots. But it turned out okay because they looked really good and we got to dance to James Brown's sex machine so that was even better. The costumes are just a part of the charm of the crew of Yazoo. The music and choreography are just as important. In a parade, you don't want to hold things up, so the challenge is to create dance steps that are also you know, moving in a forward motion as much as possible. And working with a lawnmower, which is not a normal piece of dance equipment. <laughs> there are specific moves that we always use. There's 360s, 180s. We've got the moonwalk. Some of us can actually do the moonwalk. The weave, the weave is a big thing because it's something that the crowd can see. They can see us move like this. It doesn't matter where you're standing, you can see us move. The wheelie, the classic wheelie, that's my favorite because any it's easy. We've got the dosi -si do where we change change partners. We try to always put in a can-can move. Even though we do use some of the same moves uh, every year, we, we do try to adapt them according to the theme or the song that we're using. For instance, this year, uh, one of our songs is a Beyonce song. So we're not merely just walking with the weaving. By God, we're supermodel walking with the weaving, with, with one foot in front of the other and the sachet and the hand on the hip. One friend of ours said to David one time, David, if there was a dead fish on the side of the road, you would perform for it. And that was after David blew the whistle and had them go into a routine at the end of the route when there were exactly six people on the side of the road. Because he said, they came for a show, we're giving them a show. So we say David has dead fish syndrome. We have to hire security guards each year because the crowd really wants to be a part of our group. And we love them and, and we want them to be a part of our group, but we have all of these routines and these moves and these dance steps. And as our fearless leader tells us, this is a performance and we want to be hitting it exactly right. And if the crowd is there, you can't do that. So we really have to keep them back a little bit. With 30 years of performances, there are a number of favorites among the crew. The chickens. The chickens were phenomenal. The, the look, we had, had Baton Rouge dancing with us and just, just, just pointing and gawking. It was, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Whenever I think of the songs that really have stuck with me, one of them is uh, uh, Money by Pink Floyd. That year, we were Monopoly Money. I'll never be able to hear that song again without doing the dance moves in my head. 
I hear that song and I'm sitting by myself and I'm going. <laughs> and I'm, I have an invisible lawnmower that I'm dancing with every time it comes on the radio. The year we were the grandmas, the senior moments, because boys and girls were grandmas, but we also had some pretty fantastic songs to go with it. Uh, Born to be wild, um, baby got back. That whole theme just really came together so beautifully and the crowd went nuts. I still loved Lawn Lake because I got to wear a tutu. <laughs> just I love, I always wanted to wear a tutu and so I got to wear one. I got to make a bunch of them too. The year that we were, um, that we were ballerinas and we had tutus because I'm very partial to tutus. So this was, this was one of my favorites. I think the favorite costume that I had a chance to wear was the Roman centurion outfit that was complete with a helmet with grass and on the top instead of plumes. And it was just wonderful with the cloak and the, the leg guards and the shield. And it was just a, a terrific, terrific costume. Imagine. Uh, some fairly tough looking dudes in centurion suits singing all the single ladies. That was one of the strangest and most hysterical combinations that, that I can remember. The year that our theme was Louisiana is a roach motel and we were all roaches. And one of my favorite moves was when the can of raid, we had one of our members was dressed as a full size can of raid. And I ran down the line spraying them from side to side as I went and they were supposed to flip on their backs and our legs you know, we're doing like this. Like they were in their death throes. My favorite costume is what I'm wearing. Uh, we did the zombies, uh, uh, Lawn of the Dead, and I had so much fun portraying a zombie and interacting with the crowd and scaring a few people. Every year, uh, people decorate their mowers, and uh, I'm just I'm flabbergasted by what they come up with. My partners and I have, for years, been Boudreaux and Thibodeau, and that always gets a good reaction. So it's fun to do that and sort of see what this year we can do with Boudreaux and Thibodeau. You know, do we put them in a pot? Do we dress them in some particular way? While dancing with a lawnmower may seem an odd cultural tradition, Lee has been recognized as a master folk craftsman, and the crew has participated in several cultural and artistic exhibits. First of all, the Cabildo in New Orleans contacted us and said, can we have one of your lawnmowers to put on display to represent Baton Rouge Mardi Gras? It was certainly an honor to uh, have ourselves immortalized in the Louisiana State Museum. It's, it's we're not worthy because that, that's a first class, that's like the Smithsonian, and I, was, I can't tell you how tickled we were to be a part of that. They've got our lawnmowers mounted up, up high in, a, in just this wonderful arc, this banked line of mowers suspended, it seems, in midair, and flying lawnmowers. It's, it's uh, better than we could ever have done. I was tickled that they actually used the lawnmowers we actually decorated and employed in the parade. There's a lot of things you can do that are fun. You know, you can go on vacation, you can go to a movie, a sporting event or whatever. But this is something you can do to, that brings total unmitigated joy to other people. I mean, the fact that you're dressed in this silly costume, you're pushing a non-functioning lawnmower, and you do a little twirl. And people are beaming, they're applauding, they're like telling you, oh, we love you, y'all are the best. You have brought a few moments of just total joy to thousands and thousands of people. And where else do you get the chance to do that? Some people live for money, some people live for fame and glory uh, or power. I live to walk down the street with a lawnmower and entertain a dead fish sitting on the sidewalk. Now, let's take a look at some of Louisiana's arts and cultural events in the coming week.
For more information on these events, visit our website at lpb.org slash artrocks. And to find more arts activities, check out countryroadsmag.com. Next, we're headed to Columbus, Ohio, where artist Jenny Fine is using old photographs to explore the relationship she once had with her deceased grandmother. Fine took photos of her grandmother in the last 10 years of her life and now uses those images to explore the role of loved ones who live on, on film. I'm going to start over. Sure, yeah. yeah. So the, the flat daddies are um, cardboard cutouts that are of deployed soldiers. Um, for when they're deployed, uh, de sorry, this is because I'm nervous. No, just take a breath, we're good. Take as many times as you want. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I kind of wanted to start anyway, if it's okay. Can I just start talking more about like storytelling? Yeah, is that okay? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. sort of in a family of storytellers. Just being from the South, I think it's part of the culture anyway, a way of passing on things and also making sense of the past. And, and a lot of the stories that my grandmother told me growing up, and a lot of the time that we spent together was at the table, sort of rehashing stories from the past. She was a college professor for 50 years, and so she had all of this knowledge, and at the same time was really um, sort of eccentric in a lot of ways. We would get all these things organized and together, and we'd go out and to the landscape, and she would be so patient with me and tell me stories as we were doing it, and we would reenact these things together. Now I can look back and say that my collaboration with her started really as a, at a really young age, and so when she died, I really felt like I wanted to extend that space of um, creating and that space of possibility, because in a way she made things feel really comfortable for me. When I was in grad school, uh, another student in grad school with me, Amy Powell, brought a clipping to a critique one night about the Flat Daddy Project, which are life-size cardboard cutouts from the waist up of soldiers. When they're deployed to Iraq, they would act as a stand-in for the absent loved one. And so I became really curious and interested about what, what is the Flat Daddy? How are people interacting with the Flat Daddy? And so I started to search online about all these blogs and how people were literally documenting their everyday life with Flat Daddy. I wanted to think about what was a way for me to sort of continue to work with her image um, after her death. I started sort of just as making a life-size photograph of her and posing with just the, the photograph and then um, started cutting her out and then putting her into these installations where things were happening around her and she was a part of it. I'm trying to think of the words. Um, well, I got a chance to speak about my work in Chicago a couple of months ago, and um, a guy was saying that it was interesting that I only refer to her now really as Flat Granny. It really is true that, I mean, I call her Flat Granny because this is Flat Granny. It's not my grandmother, but it is sort of me interacting with her and creating her um, is a way of sort of me trying to get back to her in a way and sort of grasp at the things that are her. Maybe I attended my grandfather's funeral, but I was so young I don't remember. So when she married Papa Clay and he died, I remember that she spent the whole reception at the funeral home walking around with a, a little um, disposable camera. And she would talk to everyone and greet everyone and she would say, doesn't he look so handsome? And then she'd walk up to the casket, charge the flash and then take another picture of him. I couldn't not get the last image. But it, my dad also agrees and I think it came to him after a, a little while too that it was, an ex it was a shared experience. There are images definitely that we took together that she said, this is for us, I don't want anybody to see these and no one's ever seen them, you know. And they are sort of the special thing for me. I think about that a lot and I, um, 
I feel quite certain that she's okay with it. I don't think I would do it if I felt that she wasn't okay. I don't think I know I wouldn't do it if she wasn't okay with it. I have a huge responsibility, you know, possessing these images and choosing how that, how these images live on and sort of her reputation. I don't know, it just felt, it felt right, it felt okay. And I think in the same, for the same reason, I feel that these, the way I use her image still feels really right and still feels really in the vein of, um, yeah, yeah, I don't know, it just still feels right. To see more of Fine's work, visit JennyFine.com. Let's take a moment to celebrate another Louisiana treasure. This week, we'll learn the history behind the king cake. This pastry treat arrives with the carnival season, which begins on the Epiphany, January 6th, when the biblical three kings visited the baby Jesus. That's where the king cake gets its name. The custom of eating a wreath-shaped or oval cake to honor the three kings goes back to Old World Europe and is thought to have arrived in New Orleans from France in 1870. In the past, such things as coins, beans, pecans, or peas were hidden inside each king cake. Then, a small porcelain figure of a baby, representing the Christ child, was baked into the cakes. Today, a tiny plastic baby is placed inside the king cake. Whoever finds the baby in their slice of cake is crowned king or queen for the day and is responsible for providing a king cake at the next party. The king cake is traditionally decorated in the official colors of Mardi Gras, which were created by the crew of Rex in 1872. Purple for justice, green for faith, and gold for power. Hundreds of thousands of king cakes are consumed throughout Louisiana, and tens of thousands are shipped to other parts of the country. It's a sweet Louisiana treasure we're happy to share. In our final segment, we head to the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, Texas, to an exhibit that has been so popular it may end up traveling the world. It is Venezuelan artist Jesus Rafael Soto's largest and final work, and its interactive nature is attracting visitors of all kinds. Jesus Rafael Soto is one of the most remarkable artists of the 20th century. Born in Venezuela, the second half of his career took place in, in France, mainly in Paris, and he was one of an important generation who explored ideas of space, movement, kinetic art, uh, essentially a formalist, thinking about color and shape and the realization of form using what he knew about human perception in order to realize spectacular works of art like the one behind me here. It was commissioned in 2004 and many Houstonians will remember that we had a similar but much smaller work on loan from a private collection out on Bissonnette and uh, it was magical to see the interaction of the public with that work and that gave birth to this much larger piece. Unfortunately, the artist died the following year, but his studio and his assistants continued the engineering necessary to make this work. It's 24,000 PVC strands, all of them hand-painted with yellow in order to realize that perfect ellipse in the center eight tons of steel above or below the ceiling, and then of course all the lighting. It was all last summer that seven people worked to thread each of those strands into the superstructure, the armature, and then it took uh, another four weeks this spring in order to mount it here in Cullinan Hall. But it's spectacular. It's been, without question, our most popular work of art and enjoyed by the, our visiting public. I don't think any two experiences are alike. Uh, people bring so much of their own history and memory and experiences. One child came through and said car wash. Uh, other people think of 
science fiction and space travel. The beauty of the work is that the imagination is set free and you can experience it either as capturing space because it is the realization of space and we become so aware of that cube within that extraordinary fan-shaped volume that Mies van der Rohe created. The perception of that ellipse which is constantly changing. To me, I, I like it most from outside and from this balcony so I can watch individuals inside enjoying it and then watching the color dance as the yellow orb reflects light. Um, but wading through it is a lot of fun too and taking a selfie inside and then uploading it to your Pinterest or Instagram account and enjoying the printout that we provide here from the printer uh, is a great souvenir to have from the museum. We'll take it down this autumn and then we'll put it back up from time to time every two or three years as time allows and the space allows, but already a number of my colleagues at other museums have asked uh, to borrow it. So I have a feeling uh, this work has legs and we'll be seeing it probably around the world in the years to come. For more information about the exhibit, visit mfah.org. And that's it for this edition of Art Rocks. Don't forget to visit our website at lpb.org slash artrocks where you'll find feature videos and information on upcoming arts events. Until next time, I'm James Fox Smith, and thanks for watching.